Hi, uh, I'm John, and thanks for joining me today as we step through the looking glass and compare two eerily similar Apache uh, stream processing projects, Flink and Kafka Streams. So a little bit of background. Uh, I've been working on Kafka Streams for about five and a half years, and I've been working on Flink for about a year now. <laughs> and back when it was exclusively on Kafka Streams, we used to talk from time to time about the differences between Flink and Streams. And since I've joined the Flink community and had some conversations with longstanding Flink committers, obviously we talk about the differences between streams and Flink. And as I've gotten deeply familiar with both systems, uh, I think what sticks out to me most actually is not the differences, but the similarities between two systems, uh, especially considering they're written by different groups of people uh, at dramatically different times in history. And that kind of convergent evolution can teach you something about the domain that you're in. Um, but also more practically, um, when two systems are that similar, their differences uh, can actually have some, some real practical applications because it's one thing to say, man, wouldn't it be nice if I rewrote my system on some totally different architecture, but you're never actually gonna do it. But when uh, it's like, man, wouldn't it be nice if I could just tweak some small but important detail of my system and use it to get uh, much different behavior out of it. That's something you can actually take action on. So um, in the structure of the talk today, I figured uh, you know, a good way to approach it would be to kind of cover some fundamentals, introduce the basic problems that both Streams and Flink uh, face, uh, discuss a little bit about you know, how they make the same architectural choices at a high level. Um, and then we can get into a deep dive uh, where we consider a few uh, specific choices that they make differently and what, they're, um, what the implications are. And then obviously end by highlighting some takeaways. So uh, without further ado, we can go down the rabbit hole. Um, this is a data flow diagram. Uh, this is a good way to depict uh, not just stream processing, but basically any kind of data processing. Uh, in particular, um, I really like these diagrams for stream processing because stream processing adopts this record by record processing model. And it's pretty easy to visualize a record coming from a source and then kind of plinkoing down through a sequence of operators until eventually the results from processing it get written up into a sync. If we look at these operators, there's two fundamental kinds of operators. There's stateless operators and the stateful operators. Stateless operator like map or filter basically just has some logic in it uh, that uh, tells it how to respond to each incoming record with no regard for the past and no um, you know, hopes for the future. But basically, you know, for example, filter, you might parameterize it with um, logic to say, hey, uh, only keep records with a color attribute that's green. And all it does is it sits there and looks at one record at a time and says, yellow, drop it, green, keep it, and so forth. Uh, in contrast, the staple operator uh, has to have some knowledge of the past in order to do its work. For example, a join, uh, whose job might be to take records from two different sources uh, and join them you know, on some attribute, maybe primary key, and then produce a combined record uh, as a result it only gets one record at a time. So it needs to remember a record that it gets from one side so that when it gets a corresponding record from the other side, it can say, ah, and compute the join result and send it on down the line. Uh, likewise, aggregate is a stateful operator. Uh, its job might be to take um, you know, a sequence of incoming records and um, aggregate them based on some dimension, you know, for example, like counting the number of records that have a particular attribute um, or a key or whatever. Uh, we'll look at an example of that later. Um, ah, right, so uh, there are a few different ways you can deal with state. Uh, actually, before I worked on Kafka Streams, I worked on a different stream processing engine. And uh, what we did there uh, was we actually did global state. So we used a Cassandra cluster and an Elasticsearch cluster. And those basically hosted all the state for the entire um, data flow. And then uh, that was really nice because then the processors are actually stateless. You can just kind of scale up and down dynamically. Uh, they can fail and recover, and there's basically no worries about state durability or anything like that. Um, on the downside, it makes the database itself into a bottleneck. So then, you know, as you're trying to scale up the processors and the database suddenly becomes a bottleneck and then you scale up the database and now you can scale up the processors more. And there's always this kind of mismatch and it's hard to hit like peak utilization of across both of those systems. In contrast, uh, both, Flink and streams adopt a shared nothing architecture, which basically means they keep the state local to the operators 
and local to each uh, independent uh, slice of the operators. If you run, if you parallelize the operators, then each parallel slice of the operator just has its own local state. And they never talk to each other. They don't talk to any common database, um, which is nice because then it means your throughput can scale linearly with uh, your parallelism and you know, the, the operators uh, in your cluster. Um, you know, on the downside, it creates all the problems that we're gonna talk about today. So um, to, to start thinking about scaling, we'll just look at a really simple data flow. We've got a source, a stateless map operator, and then a sync. If you wanna scale up and uh, your source is something partitioned like a Kafka topic, one really trivial way to, to scale up your processing capability is to partition the map operator the exact same way, and then just kind of plug it straight into the source. So you know, as records come from both partitions of the source, they just independently get transformed and written to the sync. Um, now, what if the map operator is actually slower than your data rate coming from the source? Well, you can just scale it up even more. It's a little bit more complicated because the source needs to be able to route um, you know, to multiple map operators. But uh, because map is stateless, you don't really have to worry too much about how exactly you do that. The sources can just kind of uniformly at random broadcast records to the mappers, uh, or it can do you know, some kind of hash-based partitioning or round robin, it really doesn't matter. Now I said that's, um, you have that freedom because it's stateless. Well, if, what if it's stateful? Uh, to think about this, let's introduce a quick example. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna compute um, site impressions. Basically, uh, we have some system, and every time someone visits a website, we just fire off a quick message to the source. So the source is basically just the sequence of website addresses. And all we're going to do is we're going to pipe that source through a count operator. And, and what that's going to do is basically just build up over time a count of the number of times people have visited that website, um, and then write the result to the sync. Um, if you haven't seen this kind of thing before, I included a little pseudocode so you can see how it actually uses the state uh, to do its work. Basically, it gets some website, looks up the prior count, increments it, updates the state, and then sends the website and the new count uh, further downstream to do whatever. Okay, so if you want to scale up the count operator, remember this is a shared nothing architecture. So these operators can't look at each other's databases. The count for the website has to be in some database and it becomes very important to uh, remember where that is for the source operator so that when it sends down you know, the website, it can send it to the correct partition of count. Uh, because you know, obviously if it sends it to count one here, then count one's gonna say, ah, this is the very first time you, you've seen this, some website. And then you're gonna get an inconsistent result where whenever it happens to go through count two, you'll get 32, 33. And then whenever it happens to go through count one, it'll be one, two, you know, obviously that's the wrong uh, outcome. So, uh, right, so the core problem is that you have to remember where to route uh, your messages to. Um, a naive way you could do that is you could just remember where you send them. Um, to, you know, build up some hash map where, you know, you have every grouping key and then wh whichever partition you first sent it to. Uh, the problem with that is that the size of your routing table is going to grow to be the same size as your key space, which can be very large. And also the source itself might be partitioned, in which case there's actually no way to share the routing table between the, the sources. So it just kind of pushes the problem up a, a level. Uh, in practice, what you usually do is you'll build some kind of more compact representation of your routing table, some kind of hashing scheme. You can do range-based you know, partitioning of the key space. That's the basic idea is you wanna come up with some bucketization of the key space so that you can compactly represent this routing table and then distribute it everywhere so that the sources know where to send their, their records. So that's one problem. Um, another problem that you face uh, because of the shared nothing architecture is that those state stores are local to the processing nodes. And because you know the both systems that we're talking about are distributed systems, they have to assume that um, individual processing nodes can fail at any time, which means they have to have some way to account for durability of the state. Um, we'll talk in a minute about how exactly uh, both Flink and Streams do that. Okay, last uh, concept to cover is operator chaining. So this is kind of a low-hanging fruit optimization for stream processing. Uh, basically, if you um, were to build the system so that every single operator would just you know, serialize its results over the network to every downstream operator, 
you know, these data flows can become very large, your data rates can be very high, and you're going to wind up spending 99% of your time just serializing and sending stuff over the network. Luckily, um, you actually, you do have to send stuff over the network sometimes, uh, but you don't have to all the time. And basically what you do is you figure out the rules for, okay, when do I absolutely have to send stuff over the network? And then in all other cases, you can just kind of fuse operators together so that, you know, for example, when the join passes a result to the filter, it just becomes a local function call instead of a network uh, operation. What are those rules? Well, in a nutshell, anytime you change the grouping of the data upstream, and then you have a stateful operation downstream, you've got to have a shuffle in the middle somewhere. It doesn't actually matter exactly where, but it's got to be in there. Um, and this optimization is uh, both important for performance and also kind of in your face as a system operator. So both Kafka Streams and Flink give this a name, just FYI, Kafka Streams calls these gray boxes subtopologies because it calls the overall data flow a topology. Uh, and Flink calls them operator chains, uh, which is the name I, I chose to use it for this talk. Um, and like all optimizations, sometimes it comes back to bite you. Um, and uh, so both frameworks actually give you a way to control this behavior. Kafka Streams gives you the repartition operation, which basically, even if the framework doesn't think you need a repartition in the middle of join filter, for example, you can just insert one with that operator. And likewise, Flink gives you a few different operators that are more ergonomic to use in different circumstances. Rebalance, start new chain, disable chaining, and then just basically specifying directly the parallelism of two different operators. If you set them different, then it'll just go ahead and break the chain right there. Um, just a quick explanation of why you might want to do that. If you imagine that filter is like 10 times slower than the join, then you might want to scale it up with 10 times higher parallelism. Uh, but if they're chained together, then you can't. So you might want to break the chain, introduce a higher parallelism right there. Okay, so that is uh, the end of the fundamentals. You've all got a bachelor's in stream processing now. Let's go for a master's. Okay, so um, we're gonna we're gonna step through this. These actually kind of build on each other. So uh, we're gonna start with state durability. Um, so how do streams achieve durability of its local um, processing nodes state? Well, it has a state store interface that you implement. Like for, for example, there's a key value store, basically looks like you expect. Um, and you can plug in, the, the system provides a RocksDB key value store and an in-memory uh, Java data structure, you know, hash map uh, key value store, or you can plug in your own. And then um, the system has a change logging wrapper that also implements that same interface. And when you plug in a store, uh, Kafka Streams will wrap your store with this change logging wrapper before handing it to an operator. Um, and then what happens is whenever the operator does a write to the store, that change logging wrapper intercepts the write and sends it off to a change log topic before passing it down into the store. It does that asynchronously. And then when it comes time to commit, um, it'll first you know, flush the, the producer to the change log topic, do the commit there, flush down into the store, um, you know, potentially do a commit there as well, and then carry on processing. In contrast, Flink just has one holistic implementation of the store. And, you know, like Gordon uh, very nicely detailed, super convenient that you did your talk a second ago. Um, you know, Flink has these checkpoints and that's its durability, you know, sort of intervals. And basically whenever that checkpoint barrier flows and hits a store, it says, okay, time to snapshot. The state store implementations in Flink, which also happens to provide a RocksDB backend and an in-memory backend, um, that store implementation knows how to take a snapshot of itself, basically it sort of serializes its state some way, and then um, sends it off to object storage. And then the checkpoint is done, and it can kind of proceed down the, the pipeline. All right, pros and cons. Um, the uh, Flink's approach is, in principle, much more efficient, especially for recovery because there's an opportunity to just take the on-disk data structures for your state store, ship them off to S3, and then when you need to do a restore, you just download them again and initialize your database with it and you're done. Whereas with Kafka Streams, when you do a restoration, you have to replay the changelog topic, which is a logical representation of the writes, back into an empty store. And you can do like sort of batching, there's a bunch of optimizations, but just fundamentally, you're gonna wind up doing more CPU and copying more bytes around that way. 
Um, on the flip side, the uh, streams approach is more granular. You're sort of continuously sort of trickling your state updates up to a durable storage instead of trying to do it all in one big bang operation during the checkpoint. Uh, in Flink, when you take that snapshot, you have to do it synchronously, synchronously during the checkpoint because Flink needs to know whether the snapshot succeeded or not. Uh, so that can cause sort of big pauses. If you have a lot of state built up in that store, it can cause big pauses during checkpointing. Uh, whereas, you know, in the streams case that those updates have been sort of trickling up to the brokers. And then you, when you commit, you only need to sort of flush out whatever's currently in the buffers and then do a metadata, you know, transaction commit operation on the brokers. Uh, lastly, the, that wrapper model uh, is just more pluggable. It makes it easier to write a state store backend. Um, you just have, you basically don't have to worry about durability at all. You just provide a key value store interface, system magically makes it durable for you. Now, the good news for both systems is that these approaches are not mutually um, exclusive. In fact, Flink actually last year in the 116 release added a change logging backend for the stores. And as expected, it uh, dramatically decreases the time it takes to do a, a snapshot during checkpointing. And likewise, something I've wanted to do for years in Kafka Streams is add the option to have a state store that knows how to take a snapshot of itself so that you know when it comes time, you know, periodically, every now and then, it can just upload a full snapshot of its on-disk data structures to some durable location. Um, and that would make recovery, obviously, much faster. And it would also unlock some interesting optimizations on the changelog topic. You could disable compaction, take a little bit of load off the broker, and then just truncate the changelog wherever um, you know there's a durable snapshot, and also save, save some storage on the broker. OK, so that's uh, durability. Now let's move on to running groups. And, and just to, this, this is really, like I tried to kind of tease them apart, but this is really related to the next topic. So I'm going to lay some groundwork here. But basically, uh, we discussed the problem of building a compact routing table. And uh, no surprise, streams and Flink both do practically the same thing here. In streams, uh, it divides the key space into what it calls partitions. Spoiler alert, those are Kafka partitions. Um, and then those partitions get assigned to um, streams instances as a one compute node. Threads of those instances get the partitions assigned. And that's what they actually work on. Uh, on the Flink side, uh, it partitions its key space into what it calls key groups. And uh, during job planning, those key groups are mapped to subtasks. And then uh, those subtasks are you know, at, at runtime given to a thread, and the thread actually runs the subtask. Practically the same thing is happening on both sides here. But there's really the one important difference is that Key groups are more logical. The only place they're really materialized in the system is in the save point uh, file structure. Otherwise, it's just kind of a logical routing table. Uh, whereas in Kafka Streams, the partitions are Kafka partitions. And so there's some overhead, there's metadata that the brokers need to track for partitions. So generally speaking, you're going to be more you know, eager to set key groups to really like a, a really high number um, because the thing is that, that once you partition up the key space and you start your application, that's effectively your maximum parallelism for that section of the, the computation. Here, I've got four on both sides. I can't actually scale up those computations to more than four for this one operation because there's no way to split those apart after you start running. <laughs> Um, so yeah, because the, the key groups are more logical, you can set you know, Flink's max parallelism parameter to 1,000 per operator if you want. It's not really going to hurt anything. Uh, whereas if you're you know, running a streams app, you probably don't want to set your parallelism to 1,000 for every single stage of the pipeline, because you're probably sharing that Kafka cluster with a bunch of other people, and the admins wouldn't appreciate it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, and this is really where it kind of bleeds into the next section, uh, Stream's choice to use partitions for this partitioning operation uh, lets it leverage uh, Kafka's consumer group protocol to handle kind of rebalancing when you change, you know, add and remove instances. It can be a lot more fluid about how it, you know, moves the ownership around the cluster. Whereas in Flink, if you want to change the, the parallelism of some operator at runtime, uh, you basically just take a save point, stop the job, replan it with a new parallelism, and then start it from the, the save point. OK, and the reason for that uh, comes down to how both systems choose to do uh, shuffling. 
basically this is the operation where you know we're we're basically need to send data between these gray boxes just to, as a reminder. Okay, so in Flink, what it does is during query planning, it sort of carves up the topology into those uh, gray boxes, decides on the parallelism for each one, figures out which subtasks need to send data to which other subtasks, figures out exactly what task manager is going to schedule all those subtasks on, sets up the routing tables, and then basically sends them off to, to play. At that point, the task managers always know exactly what you know network addresses to send their results to so they can flow down through the data flow. Uh, and as a consequence, Flink is basically uh, between two subtasks, it's just network. Uh, so um, yeah, and then on the stream side, uh, Kafka Streams actually puts a Kafka topic in between each one of those gray boxes. It's called a repartition topic. So when an upstream operator needs to send some data over the network to a downstream operator, it actually just writes it into this topic. And then the downstream operator is pulling the topic to get its work. So they never actually contact each other directly. It's always mediated by Kafka. Now I'm gonna assert that uh, this is fundamentally why Kafka streams can be highly available and elastic. Basically, if any um, of those gray boxes, any, any subtask in Kafka streams fails, the whole job will keep running that subtask will just get assigned to some other you know, member of the cluster, recover, and then continue processing. Likewise, if you want to increase the parallelism of uh, your streams application, you just add more members to the cluster, they join, they get some new assignment, the, um, the cluster will actually sort of gradually bleed over work, warm up the new nodes so that it can fail over very quickly um, to, to sort of move the workload around. Same thing happens on scale down. In contrast on Flink, you know, like I said a moment ago, if you want to scale up or down, or if you have a failure in recovery, it actually requires the entire job to stop, fall back to the last you know, checkpoint, and then you know, rebuild the state, and then it can start processing again. On the plus side, uh, Flink has uh, you know, a much higher bandwidth channel. There's no Kafka to be a bottleneck in between two subtasks. And I think fundamentally, that's why Flink is able to do this unified batch and streaming. I don't know if you've, you've heard about this, uh, this thing from Flink. Basically, Flink has a batch processing mode that it can do. And you can kind of see you know, why that makes sense. Because when you have a direct network connection, you can just blast these big batches of data between subtasks. Really, it's just kind of between you and your, your network card, whether that's going to be acceptable or not. Uh, whereas you wouldn't really want to just send like you know, you know, megabyte, gigabyte chunks of data through a Kafka topic. Um, okay, so I understand the the sort of bottleneck batch processing thing. What I don't understand or didn't understand for a long time is why fundamentally we couldn't make Flink highly available. It just doesn't make sense, right? Like it should be possible. So uh, it, like I said, it took me a while to to really figure out why this works for streams kind of trivially, and it's just so hard for Flink. Um, and I think I finally got it. Uh, so we're going to step through this, and it might be a bit subtle, so let me know if I lose you, and we'll spend a couple minutes here. Um, so what are we looking at? Uh, this is one, we're zo zoomed in on one streams subtopology. Uh, just to remind you, this is what streams calls an operator chain. So this is basically the section of the data flow, and remember, it's separated from everything else in the world by topics on all sides. You just said operator chain for streams. Do you mean subtopology for streams? It's Yeah, streams calls it a subtopology, Flink calls it an operator chain. Okay. Um, so now this, this subtopology might be at the very beginning of the data flow, in which case it's input topics or the sources, or it might be in the middle, in which case it's input topics are some other subtopologies output topics. Um, it might have state, in which case it'll have change log topics, um, and it might have some output, hopefully, otherwise you're just burning CPU, um, in which case there's, you know, an output topic. And these can all be, you know, one or more or zero or more. Um, okay, so what happens during processing? Basically, the subtopology is sitting there pulling one record at a time from its inputs, does some processing, maybe updates its state by sending records to the changelog topic, and then sends results out to its output topics. And every now and then it does a commit. And what that commit does is it actually draws a consistent line through all the input topics, through the changelog topics, and through the output topics. And then the operator just starts processing again. 
Um, so what we're looking at here is the white boxes are committed records. And uh, the commit point is this red dotted line. Uh, and then the red boxes are uncommitted records. So what happens if this subtopology fails right now? Well, basically, um, the overall cluster manager is going to assign this subtopology to some other node. It'll automatically roll back the offsets to the last committed offsets for the inputs. The new node, uh, when it starts up, it's going to say, oops, I don't have the state for my task here. So it's going to replay the changelog topic right up to that commit point. Um, and then the transaction on the output topic is going to be aborted. So all those reads are going to disappear. And what that means is it's basically just going to fall back to that white state and then just start processing those inputs again, you know, redo the change logs, redo the outputs. And to an outside observer, it'll be like that failure never happened at all. There'll be no evidence of those sort of dirty intermediate uh, events that were, you know, half complete. And um, yeah, fundamentally, that's that's what makes this work for streams is those topics. Now, is this just a, a basic trade-off? Like you can pick network or you can pick topics and then you have to live with your choices? No, um, it's not the topic itself. It's that the channel in between uh, subtopologies is uh, durable and replayable. So if you can come up with a way to make that network connection in between Flink subtasks durable and replayable, then Flink can also be highly available and elastic. And as a matter of fact, someone did. Uh, figure this out. So a couple of years ago, there's this paper called Clonos. And uh, you can see here that uh, some evidence that this is going on. Basically, if you look in the task one box, you can see it's got these output queues and in-flight log. And basically what will happen is if task two fails, then uh, the controller will put it on some other node. And then it'll go and rewire the network connection between task one and task two. And then uh, you know, once it starts up, it'll recover its state uh, from the checkpoint, and then it'll tell task one, okay, I'm ready for the records that you previously sent but didn't get committed, and then task one will kind of replay those, those records downstream. Now, this diagram is pretty complicated, and the reason for that is that uh, the authors also fixed a bunch of other um, sort of problems where, you know, for example, they made timers deterministic, they made RPC calls deterministic, basically every single thing that the system does, any way it interacts with the world at all, is kind of captured in these durable, consistent logs so that when you do a failover, the system can be completely deterministic. It's very cool. Um, so yeah, that's basically the end of the talk. Um, just to you know, let you know, these aren't the only interesting differences between the systems. If we had more time, we could talk about how exactly one semantics are implemented. Also, if Gordon didn't just talk about it. Um, there's also watermarking and like different concepts of time and how you manage and coordinate it between the two systems. Um, and you know how you actually represent records, whether they're key value records or key list records. Um, these all have basically the same uh, characteristics from the concept, concepts we talked about today. Two systems make different choices. There's different trade-offs involved. And I think I think there's actually a sweet spot in the middle where both systems could potentially evolve and get better uh, high-level behavior. Okay, just to close it out, um, some key takeaways. For state, layered design can be nice for pluggability. Uh, granular state updates are good to prevent sort of stuttering during these consistency barriers. Um, and then also, you know, database snapshots are nice for uh, recovery time. When it comes to shuffle table routing, it's nice to be able to dynamically reconfigure the, the routing table. And um, finally, if you can give your system persistent replayable channels and you can give it uh, granular state updates that are coordinated with your transactions, then your system too can be highly available and elastic. Um, and that's all I have for today. So thank you for listening. And then for questions, so uh, make John tell you everything. So I'm not sure which of you gentlemen will want to answer this or both, but I'm trying to understand that the are you draining the graph of data so you take a checkpoint? Do you want me to answer it? Or do you? Oh, you were sleeping. Yeah, that's the beginning off. Are you putting this barrier down? Right. And you have to wait for it to get all the way down before you allow any new data in, right? 
So the, yeah, the question is um, in that diagram that Gordon showed a, a minute ago, you have the whole data flow, you know, through a flink processing graph. And then these checkpoint barriers flow through the whole system. And the question is, do you have to drain those intermediate channels during checkpointing? Um, and the answer is actually no, but it can be nice to do so. Uh, so the whole idea of taking a distributed system checkpoint goes back to this paper, uh, you know, Chandy Lamport uh, distributed snapshot paper from like, I don't know, 1980 yeah. or something. Um, so uh, in that paper, if you read it, they actually don't drain the intermediate channels. They just record what's in them. Yeah. So basically, when you restore the checkpoint, you restore all the state that, and all the channels. That was my question. Okay. You're saving them for draining. Yeah, it's it's pretty convenient to drain the channels because then you only have to know how to take a snapshot of the state. Um, it's also nice for other things like you can, if you take a save point, for example, which is state that's rendered in a more logical form instead of the physical database files, then if you have drained the channels, then you're actually looking at a fully consistent arrangement of all the state through the whole topology and you can run queries on it and you'll never observe like anomalies between upstream and downstream operators. Uh, but there are times when it's actually not possible to drain the channels. For example, uh, these, these data flows don't have to be a DAG. So if you have sort of recursive loops in it, then like you wind up just kind of pushing the barrier around and around and around, and maybe it never terminates. Um, so I hope that answered the question. Yeah, you did. I guess. So um, I did a file for the cat the last part, which talk about the bot uh, forwards. So I think in Flink, we also have the checkpoint, which includes the more like half of size for the input. And if you use the transaction, the output also holds messages. So it seems to me like Flink can do exactly the same as this. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. I, I realized now I didn't say a very important sentence that I meant to say. So the question is, wait a minute. Flink has you know checkpoints. As we saw a moment ago, it writes down the input offsets as part of the checkpoints. So what's the, the gap? And the gap is, imagine if this isn't an, a source node in the topology. So this is a, a subtopology in the graph and there's some other subtopology upstream of it. It's just, it's just a network connection in between them. So the thing is that you have the change log, you've got your output topic transaction, you can you know, checkpoint all that stuff. But because there's just ephemeral network traffic between those two subtopology nodes, there's no way to recover those red messages. They're basically just lost to the sands of time when the recipient who has, you know, the source sent them, the recipient received them, then the recipient disappeared. No one else knows what was in those messages. And that's also fundamentally why this works is because the source, in addition to sending them, it also just keeps notes of everything it sent to the downstream operator so that it fails and recovers. And uh, you know the new operator can basically say, wait a minute, what did you send? And it can kind of replace since the last uh, checkpoint. Does that make sense? Cool. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, hi. Great job, John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Flink 1.16, change logs, right? So yes. the execution of the checkpointing will be faster since it is incremental. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. How about save pointing? Since they are the same fundamental, but if the save pointing will be faster or it will be like, because it's logical, it will be, yeah, same. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. I don't know if you know. Uh, so because save points, uh, the, the one thing that in front of save points, it has, it has to be interoperable. Mm -hmm. So you can change the save backends. Now the change log of save backends, it has a very specific format. So when you save a save point, you actually have to convert it to a uh, canonical format so that you can change the format. Uh, uh, a save point. So you can actually just, so when you take a save point, you actually fully materialize the state into a snapshot. Okay, so for the record, the question was whether that uh, checkpoint state backend for Flink uh, also incrementalizes the process of taking a save point. And the answer was that, at least in the current implementation, the save point is a sort of high level logical description of the full state of the state store. So um, no, it's just like a, a fully self-contained thing. Seems like that's not fundamental. Like you 
could in principle have a model much like the iceberg model that you know some of us learned about earlier where you've got the sort of logical representation of the state store and then a couple extra rights that are on top of it so you know maybe you can send a flip if you want <laughs> I don't know. I would love to do this. I would really love to to add this or or something like it to Flink. I don't know why the the authors of the paper didn't um, contribute it. Yes. It's kind of a, a related question. So the difference between Flink and Captain Stream is the network versus the topic is given some tasks. Would it be practical to put topics in Flink between all the some tasks? Um, yeah, Gordon and I were actually just discussing that. Um, it would it would certainly be be possible, right? You could imagine creating some kind of plugin interface, and then you could just supply your own channel implementation. Um, it might make it hard to like strike a good trade off. I think this kind of approach is probably more likely to result in not forcing people to choose between like, man, do I want to like, okay, imagine you've got a Flink job um, and you've set it up, you know, using all the defaults. So it's got network communication and you've tested it and it all works very nicely. Uh, you've got, you know, some amount of parallelism that you've set. You've got it all configured for production and you're like, I would love to make this thing HA. So you flip that thing. And then suddenly the job manager's, you know, registering tens of thousands of partitions on the Kafka cluster and everything falls apart, right? It seems like that just sort of putting that switch in might force people to make some hard, you know, trade-offs. Um, whereas something like this is a lot sort of softer. There's no, there's still no external dependency. There's still no external bottleneck. Your your I/O to disk might become a bottleneck versus the I/O to network. Um, but that's it. Seems like that's still a much more local uh, um, decision. So personally, I'd be more optimistic about this approach. Yeah, that's certainly true. Um, so if you use some other kind of um, system like Pulsar, for example, if you know advertises a much higher sort of limit on the uh, number of partitions you can put in the topics. And as a matter of fact, the the Kafka community has been, you know sort of like deprecating Zookeeper and replacing it with Craft so that they can also lift those limits. So it's possible that this all might kind of like, you seem skeptical. This all seems like it might kind of, you know, go away in the sands of time. And maybe in the future, we'll all be uh, using, you know, network channels with memory. And actually this was another another thought that Gordon and I... Yeah, that's right. The the partitions are physical, so they would be harder to change unless you implemented a change in how the Kafka broker stores the partitions. So, you know, it's just sort of a question if you kind of think about the entire system holistically, like which bottlenecks you want to squish in what order. Um, yeah, and then actually another uh, thought that Gordon and I were discussing is you could just implement a, a networking system with memory. You know, for example, it's, it's one thing if you have to format your network traffic as Kafka messages and send them to Kafka. It's another thing if your network can just remember all the bytes that it sends and just has some like high bandwidth, you know, temporary cache where it can just like cache all the network traffic and replay it. You don't actually need it to be sort of broken down in discrete records or something like that in order to be able to replay it from a specific point in time. I say all that without any particular knowledge of networking, so it could be horribly wrong. Yeah. So, so say for one large scale application, like, you know, for those internal cloud topics, so we will see a node on to trigger like a like consumer utilizing. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the last okay. part of it? We also know and trigger the consumer events. Ah, yeah. So the question was, you know, imagine you have a large scale application. You know, I've seen people running hundreds of nodes in a in a Kafka Streams application, and you just lose a node. Is that going to trigger a rebalance? Uh, this actually used to be a really big problem, um, and uh, the answer is yes, it will trigger a rebalance because a rebalance is the mechanism by which the cluster has these 
sort of synchronization points. It has to fence off. It's very important that only one task appears to the outside world to be processing that one uh, partition at, at a time, right? It's okay if the task is kind of a zombie and it just carries on processing. Maybe it lost the connection to the broker and it's just kind of happily churning through its local data, updating its state, but it cannot affect the, you know, the sort of external world view of what happens if there's another processing node that's already taken over. So the broker takes care of fencing off you know, the zombie, so that when it tries to actually commit a transaction, for example, it will say, oh, sorry, you're not the owner of that task anymore. And the mechanism by which it does that fencing is actually the, the rebalance protocol. Now, the, the problem that, that uh, used to be really big about that is that the rebalance itself was synchronous and that you couldn't process during it. Uh, but then like, I don't know, two or maybe three years ago, uh, the Kafka clients and streams teams uh, work together on uh, a bunch of changes to it. So now it's basically, there's all these like phases that happen during rebalancing where, you know, for example, everyone who doesn't lose or acquire a task can just immediately go right back to working. Um, and then uh, everyone who's losing a task has to sort of relinquish it. And then everyone uh, and then the, the there's like another small rebalancing phase where the broker assigns those relinquished tax, tasks to their new owners. Um, there's also these sort of warm-up things. So if you add a new node to the cluster, it'll actually assign it as a standby. But, so it, it wants to move some task, like task number three, to that new node. It'll assign it as a standby, wait till it replays the change log and it's fully caught up. And then it'll trigger another rebalance where it actually moves the responsibility for actively processing it over to the new node. Um, and so it'll have very little downtime uh, as it kind of scales up. And then you can have the same thing on scale down if you have hot standbys enabled. So yes, it causes a rebalance. Uh, that definitely triggers people uh, who have been using the system for a while, um, but um, the rebalance itself is actually not that bad anymore. Yeah. Rebalance, this is a great place to uh, end the talk. So let's thank John again. Cool, thank you. We'll take a short break.